Hi and welcome. My name is Farah Amber and you're listening to All the Cool Kids Are Vegan podcast. Hi everyone. Welcome back to a new episode on All the Cool Kids Are Vegan podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I've got a special episode with a very special guest. I'm super excited that he's doing the podcast with me today, um, that he's on the episode with me today. And his name is Ryuji. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and um, Ryuji, I really like. I really look up to this guy about his um, animal advocacy. So just introduce him. He is a filmmaker and animal advocate. Where he posts, um, he has a social media presence where he's talking about animal rights. Um, he's a filmmaker, so he released a documentary as well on the sentience of fish, which I think is really cool because um, I think it's an aspect that a lot of us, not that we don't focus on it, like that, that we don't talk about it, but I feel like it's sometimes not the thing that's the main like we like, tend to talk more about farm um farm animals we tend to talk more about land animals whereas fish is actually like we kill trillions of them um every year globally so i'm really thankful that you've made that documentary and um we're actually where we are right now we're at asia farm animal day uh which is hosted organized by ava summit and asia for animals and they're actually screening the summit is screening um your documentary tonight which i'm excited that everyone at the summit gets to see it um so yeah welcome let's get into it can i get um a little introduction from your side about what it is that you do and why it is that you do it Sure. So I work in animal advocacy and I primarily do educational work. So my work is about making these concepts that we think about and that we care about, uh, like animal sentience, speciesism, factory farming, wild animal suffering, and explaining them in a way that's easily understandable and engaging. Yeah, they're definitely engaging. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Um, should we start with talking about your vegan journey? Because I don't sure. think... Um, I don't know about it, so I'd love to hear more about what it is that, how long have you been vegan and what actually turns into you to veganism? Sure. So I've been vegan for about eight years now. And the way that it happened is I read this book and it was a history book called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. And there's this brief chapter about animals. And this chapter described two things that really made me think. One was about the sentience of animals. So it described how whether an animal is a cow, a pig, a chicken or fish or any other species, they feel and they think and they suffer much like dogs and cats. And the second part is it explains how much they suffer in the systems that use them. So what he explained was that the industries that use animals, like animal agriculture, they're not a charity, they're a business. And so to them, the animals are not like pets, they're products. And so how long they live and how they live is determined by how profitable they are. And therefore, if welfare has to be sacrificed in order for profit to be made, yeah. then it will be sacrificed. And it was explaining things like, for example, animals, much like humans, who are also animals, have two types of needs. So they have these objective needs and these subjective needs. Objective needs are things like food and water and maybe a little bit of shelter. Uh, you know, if you don't have food or water, you will die. Hmm. But as animals, as beings who feel, think, and suffer, we have this other type of need, which is these subjective needs. And that's, for example, in the case of humans, might be the need to bond with other humans, uh, the, 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 the need to bond with your mother after you're born, um, the, the need to play, you know, for example. With other animals, they also have such needs. A chicken, for example, would want to take a dust bath. Um, and in animal agriculture, those objective needs of animals are met because if not, there would be no business. Right. You have to feed animals, otherwise they would all die and you can't make a business out of them. However, their subjective needs don't need to be fulfilled for the product to be made. So when you eat a piece of bacon, for example, it doesn't matter that the pig who was killed for that bacon was happy or healthy or had access to fresh air or was able to play with other pigs or do all sorts of other things that pigs might want to do. All that matters is that they were as big as possible when they're scheduled to be slaughtered that they reach slaughter weights by the time that they're scheduled to be slaughtered is basically the only thing that matters. Mm. And so what happens is when you have an industry that is now on a massive scale, animals are gonna suffer as a result of that because, well, the industry from its perspective, they're like, we have to fulfill this demand. Uh, we have to produce all these animals. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we're gonna disregard the fact that animals feel and they think and they suffer. We're gonna meet their objective needs so that they do grow and they do produce eggs and they do produce milk. Um, and that way we can sell the products. 
And as a result of that, the animals are the ones who suffer. Wow. So I, I read about that and it shocked me. And there were two things that shocked me when I found out what happens to animals. One was I didn't realize how much they suffered. But two, I was shocked to realize that I had never thought about this. I grew up in France and every single day I would eat meat, dairy, eggs at every meal. And not once had I really sat down to think, where do these products come from? I wonder what the lives of these animals were like. I wonder if this is even an ethical thing at all. I never asked myself these questions and it shocked me to, to realize that how, like I, I lived almost 20 years on this earth and these products that I thought were products, these things that I interact with every single day, I never thought about where they came from. Right. And at the time, I was really into the idea of living an, um, what's that word, an intentional life. So I was being very intentional about how I spend my time and who I spend my time with and so on and so forth. And I thought to myself, well, I should probably also be intentional about the food that I eat. And so after I read that book, I read uh, other things about animals in different industries. You know, that, that book's um, specifically focused on farm animals. Mm. But I read about, and I watched videos of animals in labs or animals for who are used for fashion, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And eventually I came to this point where I was like, man, these animals really have it a lot worse than I do. And I read philosophy and the, the two things that convinced me to become vegan from a philosophical standpoint is one, I asked myself, what if it was me? Mm. So what I mean by that is that when we have conversations as humans about what we do to animals, we often talk about it from our perspective. So we say, this is what I think about killing animals for food. I think, you know, I don't like it versus I think it's fine. Mm. However, the ones who are actually being used and killed and who suffer as a result of what we do to them are the animals. So shouldn't we at least consider their perspective? And actually, shouldn't we first and foremost consider their, their perspective? So that's what I thought. And I thought to myself, what if I look at this whole farming animals thing from the animal's perspective? What would that look like? And in the current form, it looks like an absolute horror show. But even if it was much better from a welfare standpoint, yeah. I realized that being bred into the world where how you live, yeah. where you live, the day you die, how you die is all predetermined from before you're even here. Yeah. That's not something that seems just. And that's when the idea of animal farming in my head became from, it went from this normal thing that we just do in society. You know, in the same way that tech companies make TVs and smartphones, animal agriculture makes meat, dairy, and eggs. It went from that to, no, this is actually fundamentally an injustice that we're breeding these animals just for the purpose of using them, just for the purpose of killing them, yeah. because we want to eat uh, you know, pepperoni on pizza, or we want to have this filling in a sandwich um, that we clearly have no actual biological necessity for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the second thing was, I asked myself, you know, what is the actual relevant difference between farm animals and dogs and cats, mm. right? My whole entire life, I have loved dogs and cats, and I had this intuition that killing them or hurting them was wrong. And furthermore, I would have the intuition that killing them for food is wrong. Now, intuition is not necessarily reliable. So it's not because you have an intuition that something is right or wrong that this is necessarily uh, the case. Nice. However, if you actually think about it from a dog's perspective, a dog doesn't want to be killed for food. A dog yeah. wouldn't want to be locked up in a cage so that you kill them and you eat them in, in a sandwich or something like that. Um, and so therefore, I think that if we believe things like, for example, suffering is bad or causing unnecessary suffering is bad, in that case, then we can make the case that killing a dog for food is something that would be wrong. Now, if that's the case, what is the relevant difference between a dog and a chicken and a pig and a cow that makes it so it is not okay to do that to a dog, but mm -hmm. totally fine to do that to other animals? And I couldn't find... I, I couldn't find that trait. Wow. You know, we often associate things like, for example, intelligence or how much we like that animal. Um, but are those relevant? Mm. Like, should someone have less moral worth because they're less intelligent? Should babies have less moral worth than a grown adult simply because they're not as smart? Uh, or for example, the fact that animals are cute. You know, does, should it matter what an animal looks like for us to care about them? 
or should it matter what our relationship is with them? You know, we'll say dogs are our companion right. animals. They are our pets. Yeah. They're our family members. Yeah. But that just is our relationship to them. You know, whether or not an animal is your best friend, if they're locked up in a cage and say they're, they're hurt in some way, they're gonna suffer in the same way, whether or not we consider them companion animals. So in that moment, I thought to myself, I don't think there's a relevant difference between dogs and these other animals. And if that's the case, then I should think about farming and killing chickens, cows, and pigs the same way that I think about doing that to dogs or cats. Uh, and the way that I think about that is it, it would be something that is at the very least undesirable that, we, that I probably shouldn't take part in. And at the worst is something that is just fundamentally wrong and fundamentally an injustice. Wow. But did you come to this conclusion all while turning vegan? Like Well, so the way, so it's funny because <laughs> when I first started finding out about this, the first thing I did is I, I didn't know the word vegan. Mm. So I was so far from a vegan. In fact, I used to make fun of vegetarians. Mm. And the reason I made fun of vegetarians and not vegans is because I didn't know that vegans existed. <laughs> Otherwise you would have made fun of vegans. Exactly, I would have totally made fun of vegans. <laughs> but what happened was I found out how much animals in the meat, dairy, and egg industry suffer. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what to do about this, but I yeah. want to do something. So at the very least, I should not participate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you were because, vegan without the label. Exactly, because in the in the book, what the guy said was he was like, the reason that people participate in these industries is not because they have an ill intent towards animals. Yeah. People don't wake up and tell themselves, I want to hurt a baby pig today. I, I want to kill a chicken today. No, it's indifference. It's yeah. out of sight, out of mind. So we don't even think about it. Yeah. And that's something that I, I didn't want to do. And so mm. I was like, I'm conscious of it. And so I don't want to take part. I want to choose not to take part. But I didn't know this term vegan. Mm. What happened is that a friend of mine came towards me and he said, so Ryuji, I, I need to get this straight. Are you vegan? Are you vegetarian? Like what's going on? And I was like, I'll get back to you. So I went home and I, I searched on the internet. <laughs> what is the difference between vegan and vegetarian? And I found the definition of vegan. Oh, nice. Which was, you know, basically as as far as is practical, uh, vegans do not take part in things or consume things that hurt or use animals in any capacity. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that kind of makes sense. That that in that moment that made sense to me. That if we can live in a way where we're not consuming things that use animals, then why not do that? Because there's a clear distinction between animals and and like other stuff. Animals are sentient, meaning they feel and think they, they yeah. think and they suffer. Uh, like plants, for example, like a tomato tree doesn't feel and think and suffer. If yeah. you cut a tomato off a tomato, tomato tree, the tomato tree does not subjectively feel hurt. Mm -hmm. While if you, for example, cut off the tip of the beak of a chicken, which is yeah. standard practice in the egg industry, that actually hurts them. Like they feel physical pain from that yeah. and they might psychologically suffer as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that being said, I was like, if we can do this, then why not do this? And that's when I, quote, officially became vegan. Nice. That was eight years ago now. Yes. Do you, did you have, do you have a vegan anniversary that no. you know? No. I don't know. <laughs> a month area? I think September. Okay. But I'm not sure. <laughs> nice. So um, from, your, from when you turned vegan then, when did your actual animal, advocate, animal activism start? So... In, in my heart, it started almost immediately. Yeah. Because as soon as I found out what we do to animals, I wanted to do something about it. I think it, it, it reminded me of who I was when I was a child. So when I was a child, I, I loved animals. I loved spending time with them. And I also wasn't very good with humans. Um, and so, for example, I would go visit my, my family in Singapore. And there was this dog, his name was Simba. And I, I loved him so much. Yeah. And every year I would look forward to seeing him so much. And I, I loved spending, just spending time with him. Uh, and as a kid, I had these dreams of being a veterinarian, of, of working with animals. Really? You know, I wanted to be a zookeeper or a dolphin trainer cool. uh, or, or uh, a National Geographic photographer. Um, now I would never dream of being like a zookeeper or a dolphin trainer because I consider these things unethical. But back then, I, I didn't. I just wanted to be yeah, around yeah, animals. Yeah. I think we don't realize that. Because yeah. as kids, you know, we love the zoo. I think mm. there's actually a quote, a vegan quote, where it's like, um, uh, as a kid, you love going to the zoo because you love animals. And mm. then as an adult, you don't go to the zoo anymore because you love animals. Exactly. And, like that's, that. and actually, so when I wanted to be a, a photographer, a wildlife photographer, what I did to train myself, quote unquote, is one day I rented this huge lens. 
you know, which they use to photograph animals. And I went to the zoo in Singapore and I photographed all the animals there. And what's interesting is that I photographed them in a way where I try to make it look like they weren't in cages. <laughs> oh, wow. I tried to make yeah, it look yeah, yeah. like they were wild. So wow. I try to get the cages out of focus or have the backgrounds just be plants, like not see the walls and like stuff like that. Wow. Uh, and what's interesting is that if I were to go photograph animals at a zoo today, mm. that's what I would highlight, the fact that they are locked up. And I would try to highlight the fact that they are actually prisoners in the zoo, as opposed to try to make it look like they were wilds. Yeah. Um, and the wildest thing is, on the way home, I stopped by, I think it was KFC, <laughs> and I was eating fried chicken while checking the photos of all these animals. Wow. And it didn't even occur to me that I just spent this whole day admiring these certain animals, and now I'm eating the body parts of this other animal, yeah, who, yeah, who is yeah, like, yeah, in yeah. all the ways that matters, like, is just the same. Yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah. again, like, it didn't even occur to me. Yeah, yeah, I think it's crazy when you look back upon your non-vegan times and you see, like, that, yeah, you just didn't realize that you were participating in it, you know? Yeah. And it does hurt, I know what you mean. Um, to get back to what we were talking about, so, um, from when I became vegan, it took me about two and a half years to actually start advocacy. Hmm. And the reason why is because, as I said, in, so in my heart, it was like immediate. Yeah. I remember this part of me who, who loved animals. And actually, just as, as a quick other side tangent, people often think that becoming vegan is fundamentally changing who we are. It's like, I grew up eating these things my whole life, and now I have to like give everything up. However, if you think about it from, th that's thinking about it from a, a practices standpoint, from a standpoint of what we do. But if you think about it from the standpoint of who you are, of what yeah. your values are, to me, being vegan felt much more like returning to a more authentic version of myself, where these are my values. My values are of compassion and peace and kindness and justice and equality and things like that. And applying those to animals is a lot more consistent with who I thought myself to be than not applying it to animals. Um, so anyways, in my heart, immediately I wanted to do something. However, at the time, I lacked two things. On one hand, I lacked the knowledge of what I could do to help animals. Mm. And secondly, I lacked the confidence to do stuff. So I thought to myself, I'm just one person. Mm. And this is a huge problem on a global scale. What can I do? Like at the time, I was struggling to make friends in college. And I was like, if I can't even make friends in college, how am I going to like <laughs> abolish animal farming? <laughs> did you, yeah, just, uh, did you try to like, uh, implement it just in your personal life where you're like advocating I mean, for veganism towards people like, a, hey, this a, is something you should try. A little bit. I, I think I did, especially in the beginning, because to me, it, it seemed so obvious. Hmm. So as soon as I found out what we do to animals and as soon as I read, uh, you know, a few pages of animal ethics, I was like, yeah, this probably makes sense. I should probably just do this. Uh, however, I was, sh and, and so back then, like my, na my naive self thought, well, if only I tell this to people, they're just gonna change straight away, like, yeah. it's so obvious. Yeah, and yeah, then I yeah. found out that this is not necessarily the case. Yeah. Uh, and that there, there are many reasons that leads to, to people having difficulty uh, acknowledging the truth, like the reality of how the world is uh, or, or, yeah. or like whatever. Yeah, and yeah. it's not that they're bad people, it's just that that's just kind of like, we're flawed as human beings, right? And yeah. that like for you and I are flawed as well. Um, and so I think maybe I did a little bit, but not, not too much because as soon as I found out that people could react negatively to it, I think I mm. lost all confidence. Um, yeah. and I also like, because I didn't see myself as someone who was, uh, cool or, you know, like and then I, I, I didn't feel confidence in being a spokesperson for it. I was like, oh, if they think that me as a loser, if, if they, if they find out that I'm vegan, they're never going to want to be vegan. Um, so I think that like, I really had like very low confidence and, um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. like, and it alienates you even further, maybe if you like, yeah. Talk and about and also I think one thing that happens if you are vegan and you don't have a lot of other vegans around you, what happens is that you start to, in a way you, you start to get like, um, I, I don't know if this would be the correct term, but just to illustrate my points, it's almost like you're getting a little bit gaslit by society. And what I mean by that is that when you become vegan, mm. what happens is that in your like certain things change in the way that you view the world. Yeah. You start viewing the life of a chicken in the same way that you regard the life of a dog. And you think that killing a chicken is should be just as much of a crime as killing a dog. However, in our society, this this is not how the world currently thinks about these yeah. animals. 
Uh, dogs are super, super precious. Their life is priceless. And a chicken, their life, their entire life is regularly bought and sold for a few dollars at the supermarket or in restaurants. And that being the case, if you start declaring to the world that this is how I see the world, I see the life of different animals as being equally valuable, that we should equally consider their interests. You start seeing this. Now the world is, is gonna tell you, no, you're wrong. Yeah, You're wrong. The life of a chicken is much less important than the life of a dog. And they that might hurts. not say directly, but in the way that people react to you and by just the stuff that's around you, right? The restaurants that are around you, the, the supermarkets that are around you, that's the messaging that you get. Yeah. And getting that messaging, you can start feeling like, wait a second, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. M maybe my views are a little bit extreme, like mm -hmm. how people are saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't really value the life of these animals in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's one of the, the main reasons why finding community is so important. Yeah. Because it, it helps you realize that, you, first of all, you're not the only person who thinks like this. That there are many people who feel and think the same things that you are feeling and thinking. Yeah. And second of all, it allows you to have confidence to advocate for this. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're going to advocate in a way that's more apologetic or in, in, in a way where you are almost falling into the frame that society has that certain animals are worth less than others. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And, and so for me, that was that was just a big thing. So, so yeah, it, it took me like two and a half years to fully uh, actually start. And a series of things happened. But basically around two and a half years, um, I was like, I, I should really do something so i decided to take nice. like small baby steps yeah. you know i'd show up to one event here one event there uh, meet a person here meet a person there i would force myself to like say hi to people at events which is very hard for me so just to give a funny story so there was a point where i wanted to get more involved and so i decided to go to this vegan event it was like this food these food trucks or something like that and my goal was to go there and meet one person i was like i need to say hi to at least one person because they might be vegan or yeah yeah because they might be part of the community right yeah, yeah, and yeah, i didn't yeah. i didn't know anyone yeah, yeah so i was like I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna meet one person yeah i go there first of all, everyone else is in groups i'm the only one showing up alone because i couldn't even get someone to show up with me <laughs> the only one who shows up alone i see all these people in groups and i'm like i should say hi i should say hi i should say hi and i'm like too scared to do it so i stand in line to get food yeah and i'm like okay I'm going to get food. I'm going to sit at one of these tables with a lot of people and say hi. <laughs> I get my food. I walk over a table. I sit. I try to say hi. And it's like super awkward because I'm just like terrified. <laughs> and people like kind of respond, but it's like awkward. And then they just go back to talking amongst their groups. And then I'm like, oh, mission failed. You should have just said, and hey, I'm vegan. Can we talk I, about veganism? <laughs> no, and I just, I ate my meal alone and I drove home alone. Um, and I, I, did, I did this kind of thing a lot. Like, for example, when I first started making videos, I wanted to make street interview videos yeah. where I talked to people about animal issues. And multiple times, this happened at least twice, where I went out with my camera and I was like, I'm going to ask some people if they want to be in my video. And I couldn't do it. Mm. I couldn't do it. And I would go home, didn't even, talk, didn't even ask a single person. Did you have your tripod? Yeah, I had a tripod. So you just, you were there with your camera, people walking past and... Like yeah, I was walking around, like, <laughs> being like, okay, the next people that I cross, I'm going to be like, hey, would you yeah, like to do yeah, the video? Yeah, okay, okay, so you were And like, I, yeah, I just didn't do it. Around. At one time, I even drove, like, 40 minutes away from my house to force myself to be, like, with sunk cost fallacy, right? I was like, I drove 40 minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to let myself go home without talking to people. Didn't do it. Um, so... Uh, well, at least you tried. I well, think that's, like... I, I think you, it's important like I, I think step. like throughout the whole entire thing like I never gave up mm. right I was always like I'll figure it out one day so I took these baby steps like yeah I went to one event you know I, I'll go to an event here and there meet a person so here and there you should be proud of yourself for that and already. yeah no I'm very proud of myself for that and <laughs> uh and and it snowballed yeah and eventually led to like meeting people like yeah. finding more events finding more opportunities figuring out that there are all these different things that we can do I tried like a few different things yeah and you know I've been making videos since I was like 12 years old and it's something that I've always been very passionate about. I've always been very passionate about education and explaining things. I'm fascinated with the idea of taking complicated concepts and explaining them in a way that's engaging and easy to understand. Nice. And so I decided to put those two things together. And um, yeah, and then finally, once you know, yeah. I had this community around me, uh, I, I started putting myself out there a lot more. That's amazing. Kind of like combining your skills that you have for vegan advocacy or animal advocacy. So yeah, exactly. That's the way to do it, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's very important for, so 
I, I, I used to go to these events when I was first trying to figure out how to help animals. And I would ask these people who'd been in animal advocacy for many, many years, I would ask them, what should I do? Mm. Like, because for me, the goal is to help animals. So I want to be as effective as possible. Yeah. So I would ask them, what is the most effective thing that I can do? Yeah. And they would have different answers. Uh, but eventually, so there was one guy, Wayne Shung, the co-founder of Direct Action Everywhere. I asked him at an event and he said, um, I have, well, he had this, I think this longer answer, but the short answer was he said, I have nine words for you or 10, I don't know. He said, <laughs> <laughs> misquoting him. Uh, he said, uh, find your voice, find some friends and fight like hell. Nice. And that spoke to this idea of personal wow. fit of, you know, but, and I always tell people this, I do education, but it's not because I think it's the most important thing. Like, it's not necessarily the thing that's going to move the needle the most for animals. So why am I doing it? Well, it's because as opposed to something else, I can do this very well. Mm. So if I were to be a community organizer, I would do that at like a two out of 10 because, you know, I can't even organize a trip to the sanctuary with my friends. Like I try to do that, it failed. <laughs> so I can't even do that. So organizing actual events, there's no way. Yeah, yeah. However, if I have to make educational videos, I can do that much better, much better than a two out of 10. And therefore, even though, say in theory, we find out through research or whatever, that community organizing is more important. There's more of a lack for that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense for me to do that because I wouldn't do it well. No matter what, because of personal fits, I would have more of an impact doing education. Um, and so that That's being the case, I think it's very important that we combine what we're good at and what we like with how do we help animals? Kind of like imagine like a Venn diagram of like the yeah. two circles. Uh, and the other thing too is that that gives you longevity because I've seen so many people go in and out of animal advocacy. And I think one of the reasons why is because they haven't found their voice. They haven't found what they're good at or what they like. And when that happens, two things. First of all, you're not, you, it, I think it's harder to find a sense of fulfillment in what you're doing. And second of all, because you're not necessarily good at what you're doing, um, you might lack in the impact mm. that you're making. And when you try and try and try and try and you see that you're not making an impact, I think that it can be very difficult emotionally to keep going because you ask yourself, what difference does it make? None. However, if you find your voice and you find something that you're good at, now you're able to do it in a way where it actually makes a difference and you're actually able to see the tangible difference that you make. And seeing that, I think, is one of the key elements that helps you have longevity. Um, so that's why I think it's so important to find a good personal fit. Yeah, I completely agree with what you say about like um, having to like what you do. And then that's because like all we're trying to do is make the impact bigger for the animals. So any way that we can do it, so I think that's great advice for people to know that what is their skill? What do they like to do? And then they do that. Um, coming to then your skills on filmmaking, um, how with your documentary, How Conscious Can It Fish Be? When did you decide that you wanted to make a documentary? When did you decide that you want to do it on this topic? And how was the research on fish, fish sentience? And what can you share about what you've learned or what the documentary like yeah. talks about? So the reason that I started learning about fish initially is because, so what we do to fish has two characteristics. One, fish are the animals that by far we kill in the largest numbers yeah. perhaps except for insects and insects might overtake them by far but fish are for example you know the number of chickens we farm every year for meat and eggs is somewhere around like 80 90 billion around that kind of like order of magnitude yeah. however for fish uh estimates are around one to three trillion somewhere around there so it's just a completely different order of magnitude um and at the same time Fish are the animals that both from a legal and cultural perspective, we protect the least. So from a legal perspective, while for animals like dogs and cats, there are laws that protect them. For farm animals, there are some laws that kind of protect them. They're not always enforced. For fish, there's almost none. Sometimes they're even explicitly excluded from animal protection laws. And from a cultural perspective, you know, we, we love dogs, we love cats, uh, farm animals, you might kind of say we care about them with fish is we don't even pretend to care about them mm. um and so there's this interesting i don't know if interesting is the right word but there's this this contrast between yeah. how many individuals are actually a part of this industry versus how little we care and that's why i started to learn about it and learning about things like fish sentience i thought to myself you know this is taking me an awful lot of time to learn. Mm. Uh, one of the main resources I used was this book called 
uh, What a Fish Knows by Jonathan Balcombe. Yeah. It's a great book. Yeah, yeah. However, I, like, I didn't find it that accessible in the sense that, um, it, like, it was really well written. Yeah. But I was like, it's still, like, a little bit difficult to read. Like, for me, like, I had to read it, like, two two or three yeah, times yeah, yeah. To, to fully kind of like grasp everything that it was it was saying but it's a good title right because i feel in society we're so disconnected from fish and oh, we absolutely. have this idea that like a uh, goldfish doesn't uh, the one second memory yeah thing. three second or whatever three, yeah yeah <laughs> so like um then the whole the title what a fish knows it's it's like oh i want to know what a fish knows. yeah yeah, yeah. you know but um yeah, but yeah no i mean it's it's an incredible piece of work uh, however, also at the same time, like a lot of people just don't read books, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> I told myself it would be really useful if this information was presented in yeah. a way that might be more accessible to people and easier to consume. So I made this goal of creating this explainer video that goes through this research and that explains it uh, with simple words. Because also when you, you know, I, I, I want to read like actual <laughs> research papers. And those are like impossible to like understand. Yeah. It, like I, I, it, it's so like for me, it takes me a long time to read and digest them and understand them. Yeah. And so I wanted to explain it with simple everyday words, uh, and visually represents the the research, the experiments, so that you could more easily understand this area of research. And so that's how that project started. And uh, for about I think eight months to a year, I was I was researching and writing and figuring out like yeah. what research I include and how I explain it and yeah. the order and so on and so forth. Um, but from start to finish, like the whole thing took me about a year to produce. Um, and and what did you yeah. learn? That's like <laughs> that's the part that we want to know. Yeah. So I I think the so so by and large the research points towards the conclusion that fish much like other animals have thoughts and feelings and they are sentient so sentient is the term that refers to the capacity to feel subjective um subjective things yeah. so it's the capacity to feel uh to, to experience sensations um basically and it's quite clear from the research that they they have this yeah however what i found most interesting is to think about this from an evolutionary perspective. So for example, you take the question, do fish feel pain? One question that I find very interesting to think about this question is what if fish didn't feel pain? And you think about like, what, what, like, what is a fish? A fish is this animal who moves around in the world. And if they didn't feel pain, it would be very difficult for them to effectively navigate this. So there's an example of this in humans. There's this condition called CIP. It stands for congenital insensitivity to pain. And people who have CIP cannot feel pain. So they can put their hands over a fire oh. and it doesn't hurt. They could fall from a high place and break their, their leg and it doesn't hurt. Is that the nerves that are just, the brain isn't registering the nerves or something? Or? I'm, I'm not sure the exact <laughs> mechanism through which like this happens, Yeah. but the result is that this, this happens, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And so on one hand, this seems like a superpower. This pain kind of <laughs> sucks. Like, I don't want to feel pain. Yeah. However, on the other side, there is this one researcher who researches this. And he says that it can really be like a curse. Because although you don't feel pain, when you do things that are supposed to hurt, it still damages your body. Yeah, yeah, so if yeah, you fall yeah, from yeah. a high place, your leg might not hurt, but your bone is still broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happens is that he said that a lot of his patients, and particularly the males die sometime in their 20s because they they act recklessly oh, wow. and they do these things that damage their bodies too quickly and they end up dying wow. for example there was this young boy who was a street performer and what he would do is he would stab his he would stab his arms with knives mm. and walk on burning coal and then he would get money and then in the afternoon he would go get patched up in the children's hospital Oh, and wow. one day for his 14th birthday, he wanted to impress his friends. And so he jumped from the roof of a house and he actually got up and, and went about his day, okay. but he passed away later that day. And so the point is that even for humans living and, and humans, you know, we think of ourselves as the most intelligent species and we have all these security systems in place to make sure that we're safe and that we're okay. You know, if we get hurt, we can go to the hospital. Uh, you know, like there, like on windows, there's like glass so we don't fall. Uh, there's all these things that are supposed to make society safe. 
And despite that, if you don't have the capacity to feel pain, it's very difficult for you to function in this society. Yeah. Now fish have been living in the ocean for hundreds of millions of years before humans even existed. So the idea that they would be able to, to navigate this environment, like the wide open ocean, that's much more complex than and random than our society without the capacity to feel pain is much more unbelievable than they were oh yeah, they were just able to do this for hundreds of millions of years no big deal with uh, without the capacity to feel pain so basically you're saying that um we need the capacity to feel pain to survive and well in a way like that's what that's what emotions and sensations are so yeah. if you think about sentience from an evolutionary perspective if you move around the world uh and you're trying to survive and reproduce which is the whole point of natural selection yeah without having subjective experiences is very difficult yeah, yeah, yeah because in the world there's like other kill. random stuff yeah. that's happening you run into these <laughs> obstacles and these problems yeah. and you have to solve these problems and so if you have the capacity to actually subjectively experience this hmm. and solve the problem it's a huge advantage over someone who or something that doesn't have that yeah you know and and if you think about what emotions are they're they're signals that allow us to act in ways that help us survive so for example, an yeah. example that is very easy to understand is you take a monkey mm. who is looking at a tree and the tree has bananas and under the tree is like this lion. Now the monkey has to decide, do I risk my life to go get these bananas? Uh, and if the monkey was trying to do this, this calculation rationally, then the monkey would have to like take out a notepad and a pen and do all these calculations. Like what's the probability that I get eaten if I act like this and this and that. Uh, but, but in, in nature, in real life, there's no time to do that. Yeah. So instead what happens is that the monkey's brain is going to process all this information is going to see how far is this tree? How ripe are the bananas? How satisfied does this lion look? How hungry am I? Wow. And based on all this stuff that happens in a split second, the monkey is going to feel an emotion. If the monkey, for example, is very hungry, hasn't eaten for days, and it's like there's no food anywhere else, yeah. the monkey might feel courage to go get these bananas. Uh, but if the monkey is kind of fine and the lion looks kind of hungry and the bananas are not that ripe, mm. then the monkey, the monkey might feel fear and 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 move away yeah so emotions are the results of these calculations that happen in inside our brains um that that signal to us okay this is probably the path ahead to survive and reproduce basically yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and pain is one of those signals that you know it's very useful that if you put your hand over a fire it hurts you so you don't do it because if it doesn't hurt you then you'll just walk in the fire and die <laughs> right yeah so in that sense the capacity to feel pain even though it might seem like a curse, is also quite in in, in quite a literal sense. Saves your life. Sorry. What it, yeah, what <laughs> saves our lives and what allows us not to accidentally kill ourselves or hurt ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this like throughout your research, this was uh, so you're basically your research acknowledges that fish feel pain, they suffer, and that's the like um for me, like surprises me. Maybe I'm just very vegan, but it surprises me that we actually think that ve that fish don't feel pain. Mm. Like, well, I, I think that's the stereotype that we have of them. Yeah. So one of my main goals was to debunk the stereotype okay. that we have about fish yeah, that yeah, there yeah, are these yeah. simple primitive animals who don't think. You know, there's this stereotype yeah, 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 that yeah. goldfish have a three second memory. Um, like a lot of people will say that no fish like they, yeah, they don't yeah, feel yeah. pain, or they'll say these ridiculous things like, um, you know fish may feel pain but they don't actually care that they feel pain and so, things like yeah. that um so basically it's about finding the similarities we have i think because fishes are so different from us like mm -hmm. mammals and their yes. aquatic animals and because there's i think what a fish knows talks a little bit about yes. that is that that we have a disconnect because they're so different from yes. us um so is it about finding the like how you relate how what you explain about the monkey is about seeing that similarity in the fish and how they it could be I, process there's, things. There's two somewhat conflicting viewpoints we could take on this. Okay. One is that there's something very beautiful and valuable about realizing what we all have in common. Yeah. Um, that thing I would say is sentience. Yeah, 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 yeah. This capacity to subjectively experience the world. Yeah. That in turn leads to things like thoughts and emotions and having good experiences and suffering. That is something that whether we're human, a dog a whale, a chicken, a fish, or a crab, 
we like we share this in common yeah um and there's something very beautiful about acknowledging that however there's also something really beautiful about acknowledging the differences that we have and valuing each other regardless so for example take an animal like an octopus an octopus their last common ancestor with humans were like so was like so 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 long ago it was mm-hmm. like this little amoeba thing that was like you know so different from the animals that we know today or the ones that we think about at least yeah um and what's interesting is that they evolved on a completely different branch of the evolutionary tree than we did and as partly as a result of that they perceive the world in a completely different way to us so for example the suckers on their arms can taste things nah. uh, their skin can actually pro- like um, process light their skin is sensitive to light and reacts to light uh, those are things that you and i don't have as homo sapiens and the question is like what do you feel like to taste things using your arm <laughs> or like if my skin could perceive light like would it look like my back? Like, would it be like really dark because I'm wearing a shirt? Like, what would that be like? I have no idea. But the point is that it feels like something. Yeah. And whether you're a human, a dog, or an octopus, or a fish, or a chicken, being that animal feels like something. It doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Feeling like a salmon feels different from feeling like a chicken, and that feels different from feeling like a human. However, the important thing is that it feels like something. And I feel like there's something very powerful in acknowledging that yes, our experiences are all different, but there is an experience there. And because there's an experience there, we should value that experience and we should value that individual's life. I love it. That, that's And that's really nice what you share about octopus. And um, is that was that also included with your fish sentience research, the octopus? Uh, it, it was included in the research. However, it didn't make it into the final thing. I wrote yeah. a whole section for it, like a script, and then I scrapped it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also an important aspect. I mean, we talk a lot about octopus in yeah. the space nowadays, which is amazing. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up and cut it short. But I want to ask you one final question, which would be for all the people listening today, what's one final message that you want to share to them? One final message is that I think one of the most important things we can try to push for culturally is to change our culture so that we think about and feel about farm animals and other animals the same way that we think and feel about dogs and cats. So in terms of thinking about them, we think about them as valuable. But I think there's also something very beautiful and powerful about trying to change how we feel about them. You know, even though you might think that the life of a chicken is worth the same as like the life of a dog, when you first think that, you don't necessarily feel that way Mm. just because we live in a society where it's so the opposite of that. So I think there's something very powerful about spending time with animals Mm. and and actually getting to to like look in their eyes and and seeing their personalities and their individuality and um, feeling about them. Uh, a certain way as well so obviously the the most important thing at the end of the day is how we treat them you know we like we have to change like what their actual experiences are like yeah um however i think that um f- for me at least actually changing how i feel about animals not through my own will but just like spending time with these animals like it really it really changed me um that has yeah. really made me uh, a much uh i would say determined advocate for for animals uh, because for me, like I, I feel about these animals the same way that I feel about um, about dogs and cats. So, yeah, that is my final word. It's for people to spend more time with animals, I think that's amazing. I think, and anyone will benefit spending time with animals if you uh, you can recognize them. Like animals have such a pure soul, and I think you can recognize that when you're with them and you, their presence. They're 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 not on their mind like human beings. Like they're just in the present moment, and I think we can learn a lot from animals and. It'll like, really help in vegan advocacy, of course. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for being on today's episode. I think listeners have learned so much from you. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's been really special. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the All the Cool Kids Are Vegan podcast. I hope to see you soon. If you want to stay updated for upcoming episodes, please follow me at Farah Vegan on Instagram or follow the podcast channel at All the Cool Kids Are Vegan on Instagram as well. And I will see you soon.